Yourself, and I will be presenting about uh, integrating variable renewables in electricity markets. And as you said, I will try to give you some details about my research, but at the same time, I will also try to give you a bit of the broader perspective, why this is important and what are the uh, context in which these uh, processes are happening. So I will try to balance detail with some more context as well. So when talking about variable renewals, the first thing we have to talk about is how impressive its cost development has been in the last decade. In this graph, you can see uh, the levelized cost of electricity, which is just the average cost per kilowatt hour or per megawatt hour during the lifetime of the system. And here we can see different renewable technologies. Uh, we can see solar PV, usually called just PV for photovoltaics, concentrating solar power, usually called as well CSP, concentrated solar power. And then we have two types of wind onshore and offshore. The main variable renewable energy sources are PV and uh, wind because concentrated solar power uh, comes from the energy from this uh, technology comes from uh, the heat of uh, solar energy rather than light, so it can be stored as heat. So it's not as variable as PV, which is more difficult to store because it's converted directly to electricity. And it's also not suitable for so many climates because CSP is usually located in uh, rather hot and desertic climates whereas solar PV is widely available anywhere. As long as there is sunlight, you can install solar PV. So from now on, when I talk about variable renewables, I will be referring to solar PV and both types of wind onshore and offshore. But in any case, you can see in this uh, gray area, the range of fossil fuel costs. And you can see that uh, PV was very expensive just 10 years ago. It was about th almost $38 per megawatt hour or $0.37 per kilowatt hour. But its cost has been declining quite fast and nowadays is within the range of fossil fuels or in many locations even below that uh, range already. This uh, is the 95% uh, uh, interval of all uh, installations installed worldwide. And this source is uh, IRENA, which is the International Organization for Renewal Energy. Although PV has decreased its cost dramatically, that happened also for almost all renewals, as you can see here. And nowadays, all of them are within the range of fossil fuels. So most of you probably knew that, but I think it's always important to emphasize how strong this cost decline has been and quite unprecedented because many people here thought the cost would decline, but, but much is lower. But the cost decline was very fast and is expected to decline further. So for this reason, and also because it's the most available type of energy sources, wind and solar will be some of the main uh, technologies that we will have uh, in our future electricity system. The International Energy Agency released a report last year about what it would take to have a decarbonized electricity system, so-called net zero by 2050. And according to their projections, if we, want, if we want to get there at the lowest possible cost, we will have to increase the share of variable renewals quite significantly from less than 10% of electricity production nowadays to 40% already in 2030, so in less than eight years, and to 70% uh, by 2050. And this is even stronger if we take into account that we will go through a process of electrification as well. So it's not only the share that is increasing, 
but the total amount of electricity will have to increase as well, both in developing and also in developed countries, because we have to electrify sectors that before were run with other fuels, such as gas, oil, coal, etc. So we are living two processes at the same time. On the one hand, electrification of sectors that were run by other uh, sources before, and at the same time, a transformation within the electricity sector itself to switch towards variable renewables. So this looks very good, but there are some problems. The main problems, as its name suggests, is that they are variable. So they produce only when the resource is available, when there is sun for solar or when there is wind for, uh, for wind power. So in this graph, we can see the normalized generation for both wind and solar, wind in blue and solar in orange for California and for Germany. And uh, here we can see the different types of seasonal cycles that these technologies have. We can see that on the one hand, solar energy produces always more in summer than in winter. In the northern hemisphere, the summer is uh, in June, around June, July. Uh, so we have the same seasonal pattern for uh, solar. However, for wind, we have that its seasonal pattern, it's more location specific. So we can see that for California, the seasonal pattern is the same as for solar. It produces more in summer than in winter, but for Germany is the opposite. In Germany, wind produces more in uh, winter than in summer. That's the seasonality level that we can see here. But in addition to that, we have the diurnal cycle. The fact that uh, these technologies produce more during day for the case of solar, as you can see by the patterns for each month. So each of these boxes is the normalized generation for the month. So it's the average for each hour during one specific month in 2016, if I remember well. So solar, of course, produces around noon and wind. Again, its pattern is more location specific, but usually produces more uh, during night than during day. We can see it quite clearly for California, for instance, uh, where the diurnal pattern is, um, is almost perfectly opposite. In addition to these two, we would have also short-term intermittency, which we can see in this figure because this is the average of all the same hours for one month. But if we only looked at one specific installation of wind, let's say, we would see more or less this diurnal pattern for California. But if we just look at one windmill, probably this would be much more viable. Something like this, maybe then. And what's up and then again and things like that. For solar, it's similar. It changes a lot depending on clouds and so on. So this variability, short-term intermittency, diurnal cycle, and seasonality are problems to integrate variable renewables into electricity markets. They are problems because they cause integration costs to the electricity system. So as we introduce more and more renewables in the electricity system, their levelized cost doesn't change. Actually, it changes if we consider the dimension of time because there is learning. So the costs tend to decline. But if we omit the scale of time and we just increase penetration of variable renewals of solar and wind, then the levelized cost would be the same across the penetration range. But as we put more and more renewals, then the system cost increases. The system cost is the sum of both the cost of each individual technology and the cost of managing all technologies together. And that's why we say that variable renewals cost additional integration costs to the electricity system. Because the more variability, 
the more managing, let's say, managing costs that we have to control for that increasing variability. Uh, you can also see that the uncertainty range is quite large because it really depends on how we uh, adapt to higher integration of variables in the universe. Although they cause these kind of problems, there are also many mitigation options, some of which we will see later. So the electricity system that we used to have was based on very big generators, power plants that uh, burn fossil fuels mainly or uranium in the case of nuclear. They generate electricity that is fed into the transmission and distribution grids. And from the transmission and distribution grids is uh, transferred to the final consumers, households and industries. Um, there are two markets, the wholesale market, where the suppliers, the generators uh, offer their electricity, then the retailers buy that electricity and sell it to the final consumers. Although some big consumers can buy directly on the wholesale market. That was the system that we used to have, or that is in an ongoing transformation nowadays. Because now we have uh, new technologies, variable renewals that are substantially different from traditional power plants. They are different in at least uh, two senses, although actually more. But the main ways in which variable renewals are different is that first, they can be uh, installed decentralized. That means that we can install small PV panels, for instance, on our rooftop and we can generate electricity by ourselves so from now electricity can also be generated from the retail side and fed into the grid directly from the demand side something that before was uh, not common at all i would say even non-existent in most places so the renewable plants are much smaller, so they can be installed uh, much more diversified in spatial terms, but they are also variable, as I mentioned. So they produce just depending on weather patterns. If it's sunny and windy, they produce a lot. If it's cloudy and calm, then they don't produce that much. So we are moving from a uh, centralized system in which power plants are dispatchable and they adapt to demand patterns to a system in which supply or at least higher shares of supply are variable we don't have control over production and they are more spread they can feed electricity into the grid also from the retail side and that will cause many let's say problems because we will have to deal with new phenomena that didn't happen in the past, such as variability and such as uh, self-consumption. So my work on these issues, uh, I have worked on photovoltaic self-consumption from the retail side and also from integration challenges of variable renewals in wholesale electricity markets. Uh, today, I will be focusing on this uh, left side of the figure, and I will be talking about some of these integration challenges, and I will mention one of the solutions, one of the potential solutions. There are many. I will mention several, but I will focus on one of them. So first, I will talk about the main problem, the cannibalization effect and then about one of the potential solutions, which is a spatial integration of electricity markets across countries and deployment coordination of wind and solar capacities across those countries. If we do that, the basic idea is that we can offset opposite generation patterns and achieve a flatter generation profile. That's the general idea. Uh, remember, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to interrupt anytime. So I also have time to drink.
So the cannibalization effect is basically defined as the decline in wind and solar market values as the penetration of wind and solar increases in the electricity system. And you may think that that's nothing new because in any market, when supply increases, price, ceteris paribus, always goes down, right? Whereas that's true, there are a number of uh, specificities in the electricity markets that make this effect stronger and more concerning for the case of variable renewables in electricity markets. Some of these characteristics are related to variable renewables themselves. The fact that they have zero marginal cost, that means that once we install capacity, there is no production cost anymore. Because when I install my solar panel, I don't have fuel costs, operation and maintenance costs are fixed and almost negligible, and uh, the sun shines for free. Unless there is a sun tax, in which case there would be production costs. But <laughs> omitting that for now, we can discuss that later if you want. But omitting a uh, sun tax or anything like that, uh, variable renewals have zero marginal cost. That means that whenever the resource is available, it's worth it to produce, even though the price is zero because there are no costs. That's uh, quite a specific from renewals in the electricity system, because if you think of fossil fuels, they all have marginal costs, fuel costs, uh, operation and maintenance costs that are variable. So they depend on how much you produce, etc. And the second is, as I mentioned, variability, whereas we can dispatch as much production as we want with fossil fuels, we can't do that with variable renewables. So those are the characteristics of renewables that affect this effect. And there are also characteristics of the electricity good itself. The fact that electricity is in principle non-storable, now we are learning how to store electricity in batteries and uh, in other uh, facilities. For instance, hydro uh, power is a way of storing electricity as well, although not in electric form. Uh, but in principle, it's non-storable at large scales. Yet, it will be in the future, and that will be one of the solutions for the cannibalization effect, storage. But so far it's not. So if it's not the storage, we will see what are the consequences. So electricity is non-storable and it's perfectly homogeneous. When it's produced, you can't differentiate uh, electrons. So electricity is perfectly homogeneous, actually in three dimensions, time, space, and uh, the time between contract and delivery. If you, it's like uh, flights. If you book your flight earlier, you will get a better price. That happens with electricity as well. Uh, there are several markets, real time, day ahead time, and so on. Uh, but within these three dimensions, electricity is perfectly homogeneous. And finally, one characteristic from the electricity system itself, which is the power system stability constraint. The fact that demand has to be the same as supply at every point in time, 24-7. Otherwise, there would be blackouts. Uh, so to keep the stability of the system, supply and demand has to be the same every moment. So why these characteristics affect or cause the cannibalization effect? First of all, the fact that renewables are variable and that they are non storable means that producers don't have any control over their supply beyond curtailments. Curtailment means that they can cut their production even though it's sand, for instance, or even though it's windy, they can just stop the uh, wind turbines from, uh, from running. You may see sometimes that they're stopped even though there is wind. That may be because there is overproduction. 
So because uh, they don't have any control over their uh, production, uh, they cannot regulate up and down. They can regulate down actually through curtailment, but they can't uh, produce more if they want. And uh, the fact that they are zero marginal cost and perfectly homogeneous at the same time entails that prices always go down as penetration increases. That doesn't necessarily happen in all markets. For instance, imagine a product that is uh, zero marginal cost, but is not homogeneous. For instance, uh, software. We have different softwares. Software has zero marginal cost. It doesn't cost anything to copy the software and paste it somewhere else. But because they are different, they can have different prices, even though uh, production is, uh, has zero marginal cost. And uh, the opposite, if we have homogeneous products with positive marginal cost, that positive marginal cost will set the floor at which suppliers are willing to sell their production. So the fact that uh, the product is perfectly homogeneous and that these technologies have zero marginal cost implies that whenever there is more production, the prices drops because they will sell anyway. And the fact that the system has to be balanced at all times implies that prices can even go negative if there is overproduction. And this may happen because of several reasons. Because there are some power plants that are not flexible enough. They can't uh, cut their production. For instance, nuclear. Nuclear power can't just decline its production suddenly. So, there is a, some amount of energy that has to be being produced every moment if we have this kind of so-called base load technologies. So if we have base load plus a lot of variable renewables and that production is higher than demand, then prices may even go negative because we have to cut production. And those are the conditions that uh, cause the cannibalization effect and make it uh, more worrying in electricity markets. The mechanism through which this happens is called merit order effect, which means that as uh, renewals enter the market, the first thing that happens is the prices go down. So we can see this from two different perspectives. From a demand perspective, we can understand higher renewals as lower residual demand or residual load. So here we can see a stylized supply curve where the lower step is base load uh, technologies, for instance, nuclear. Base load technologies are characterized by having high fixed cost and low marginal cost. And for that reason, they produce as much time as possible. Because one, once uh, capacity is installed, their production cost is low. So they enter the market first. The second ones to enter the market are the so-called load following, such as uh, sometimes of coal and sometimes of gas. And the last ones would be the ones with lowest uh, capacity cost and highest marginal cost. And those are usually open cycle uh, gas turbines. So if we have this supply curve, of course, in reality, this curve is more continuous, it's not stepwise. And we have a specific level of demand this year. When renewals enter the market, this arrow here, variable renewals, that's equivalent to reducing demand by that amount. Because the, due to their zero marginal cost, they always enter the market. So effective demand is lower, and we go from this higher price, P0, up here, to a lower price, P1. And we can see that in the same way if we just interpret higher renewals as additional zero marginal cost supply. So the supply curve shifts to the right, and uh, we have the equivalent effect. That's the so-called merit order effect, and that has been documented in all liberalized electricity markets. 
And this is the mechanism through which higher variable renewals depress electricity prices. And because prices go down exactly when renewals are generating, they would be getting lower revenues from their electricity. So here we are seeing something similar, but here we see what is called price duration curve, which means that we sort all hours of the year according to their price. So on the left side, we have the hours with the highest price of the year. And as we go to the left, we have the hours with the lowest price. So uh, we have a situation with low penetration of renewals and we have this number of hours with this number of prices uh, in orange, right? And the average price for that year is uh, T0. When more renewals, when I say renewals, I mean variable renewals, because there are some renewals that are not variable, such as uh, solar thermal or such as uh, biofuels, for instance. But here I'm talking about wind and solar variable renewals. So when variable renewals enter the market, then prices go down and we will have all hours with lower prices. In some cases, we can even have hours with negative prices and the price goes down from P0 to P1. This is what happens in the market as a whole. But as I mentioned before, this happens in the hours mainly when variable renewals are generated. And therefore, if we look at the unit revenues of variable renewal energy generators, that means the prices at the times when they are generating, weighted by how much they generate, then if we take the case of solar, for instance, we will see that solar is correlated with demand because we demand more during day than during night. So at low penetration, solar unit revenues, the generation weighted electricity prices that solar generators receive is even higher than the average electricity price in many cases. But because this merit order effect happens in the hours when they are generating, the drop in their market value, in their unit revenues is much stronger than the merit order effect itself. So this merit order effect affects more variable renewals than any other generator, than gas turbines, for instance, or than uh, coal uh, generators. To the drop in uh, unit revenues, we call that absolute cannibalization effect because it's just the reflection of the merit order effect but for the case of variable generators. When we compare both the fall of unit revenues compared to the fall of overall electricity prices, we call that the relative cannibalization effect because we are making it relative to the overall evolution of the wholesale electricity market. So here we can see uh, an example of how this plays out in a market such as California. So here we are comparing two days in California. In 2013, we are comparing one day when there wasn't much uh, PV yet, photovoltaics. And in this day, 2016, there was a lot of photovoltaics already. Here in orange, uh, we can see normalized generation of solar it's just normalized to 50 so don't care about the scale just about the shape of the distribution so of course we can see that it produces just during the day between 6 a.m and 6 p.m approximately and at low penetration the generation of solar is correlated with electricity prices electricity prices are high at noon because people use more energy, more electricity at noon during the day. And for this reason, when we weight 
the generation of solar times the price at each time we have the unit revenues of solar which were higher than the average electricity prices that day during the whole day so if we divide unit revenues by electricity prices then we have what we call the value factor which is just that unit revenues divided by average electricity price. If the value factor is higher than one, it means that solar energy in this case is more valuable than the average unit of electricity traded in the market that day. And that's because generation of solar is correlated with demand. So it's very valuable. In this case, solar is 30%, 35% more valuable than the average unit of electricity traded that day. However, when there is a lot of electricity, we go to 2016, already a lot of installed capacity of solar, solar generation is much uh, larger. So the merit order effect happens exactly when solar is generating a lot, which is at noon. So the correlation that before was positive now turns into negative. And now we see that electricity prices are lowest exactly when solar is generating most. And that's why electricity prices go down due to the merit order effect. But the unit revenues of solar generators go down even stronger. And that's why now unit revenues divided by average prices is much lower than zero. In this case, 0 0.5, meaning that solar is worth only 50% of the average unit of electricity traded this day in California. So this is the mechanism how higher capacity leads to more generation of zero marginal cost electricity which drives down prices to the merit order effect and uh, hits back to renewable generators through the fall of unit revenues and therefore the fall of the value factor because unit revenues fall stronger than average prices. So this is just the data of California, how unit revenues evolved for both solar and wind between 2013 and 2017. This is not that interesting because as I said, it's just the reflection of the merit order effect. What's more interesting is the evolution of value factors. Remember unit revenues divided by the average prices each day. And as we saw in the example before, at low penetration, unit uh, value factor is above one or above 100%, meaning that solar is very valuable, but it falls very quickly. Even reaching, as we mentioned before, uh, negative prices in, in some hours, in some days of the year due to overproduction. However, for wind value factor, were quite stable or even slightly uh, just very briefly uh, if you want more details uh, you can go to the paper itself which is open access so here we model how unit revenues and value factors change depending on the dynamics of the wholesale market so depending Pierre, on how yes can we ask a quick question you yeah, sure yes because you, you indicated that we were uh, that you were open to receive questions mm -hmm. My question is about the negative price. Is that a theoretical concept or in reality it became negative, the price? Because I, I don't see how in reality it could become negative, but um, I would- It happens in reality. This is empirical data. So this was reality in California. And it may happen for some reasons. For instance, for nuclear, as I said before, if nuclear can't go down and there is too much production, uh, then solar has to cut. But if there are feeding tariffs, 
Fitting tariffs if is a policy in which uh, the regulator pays a specific price to solar or wind, regardless of how much is the market price. So imagine that the fitting tariff is, uh, let's say 50, uh, in this case, $50 per megawatt hour. Then even though prices are negative, generators don't have any incentive to stop producing because they will receive the fitting tariff. That's why nowadays fitting tariffs are being phased out because they don't provide the right incentives for generators to react to market uh, prices. Okay, thank you. In California, there weren't many fitting tariffs. There were other mechanisms, but in Europe, there were many fitting tariffs. Uh, but nowadays they are being phased out in favor of other more, let's say, market-friendly uh, policies. Uh, but yeah, they are not common. Negative prices are not common and they shouldn't be. Sometimes uh, you can see on Twitter or things like over there that people uh, are happy about negative prices because they think uh, consumers will pay more. But actually market prices that are negative imply that something is wrong. In this case, that we have integration costs due to variable renewals that we will have to pay somehow. So it's not a good sign, but that's being solved by having more, uh, let's say, market-friendly policies. So we estimated uh, how unit revenues and value factors, which is uh, what is being shown here, the value factors of wind and solar, change as we increase the generation of wind and solar. So that's why it's called cannibalization, because the more wind, the more solar, the lower their own value. And everything is as expected. Somehow all cannibalization effects are negative, meaning that the more penetration, the less value of uh, wind and solar, except the uh, effect of solar penetration on the wind value factor. So if we put more solar in the system, the value of wind goes up. Uh, and why that is the case? Actually, we were quite puzzled at the beginning. We didn't know why, but we think that the answer is uh, in the generation patterns that we saw before. So you can see that in California, they have exactly the opposite daily generation patterns. So if we look at electricity prices in California, here you can see electricity prices for each month of the year for several years between 2012 and 2017, and the average for each hour of the day, each month. And it's very clear in April, for instance, how the merit order effect is happening when solar penetration increases. So the light blue are the years without much solar generation. As solar generation increases, then price decreases, but increases just before and just after. And that's because we need more flexibility in the system and therefore uh, more expensive uh, generators. And because prices go up exactly when wind is generating more, that's why the value of wind is higher as solar generation increases in California. We believe that's the explanation and there are some other papers that offer similar explanations. So, so that points towards certain level of complementarity between both the models. And uh, why is this important? Because uh, we can look at integration costs either from the cost perspective, as I mentioned before. So integration costs are how much it costs to the electricity system uh, in addition to the levelized cost, each additional unit of electricity. But we can also look at it from a value perspective. And in this case, the integration costs are the difference between average market prices and unit revenues of, in this case, wind, but could be solar also. So basically the relationship between both is what we defined before as the value factor. Unit revenues of one technology of wind or solar divided by the average electricity price. So this is a way to estimate 
uh, integration costs ex post with market data. Because usually this is estimated uh, ex ante with uh, electricity system models, which are more engineering models of the whole electricity system. That's one of the implications of this. And uh, it has many other implications that we won't discuss now. Or if you want, we can discuss later in the QA. Uh, about decreasing uh, variable renewals competitiveness, increasing integration costs, uh, increasing value of flexibility, higher policy costs for the case of feeding tariffs. And it has implications for market design as well. There is a very good paper by Tom Brown and uh, Reichenberg, the same as uh, in the integration costs, that look at how. Um, Internalizing external costs helps mitigating the cannibalization effect from the market perspective. So they are able to recover their revenues because costs are being internalized. Uh, I don't know how much time I should spend, Maria, because we can either leave it here or I can talk a bit more about spatial integration, which is a yeah, way of. Um, if you wish, you can talk uh, five, 10 minutes more, and then uh, we open for questions or five minutes more. Okay. As you wish. As you wish. okay, so let me just uh, very briefly describe one of the solutions, which is spatially integrating renewals from different places. And that's related again with the generation patterns. So the idea is just to install renewals that have opposite generation patterns such that uh, when we aggregate them, they get uh, a flat profile. Let's say. We are doing this with some colleagues from uh, University of Coruña. Uh, the method we are using is modern portfolio theory, which is an optimization method to optimize uh, the trade-off between getting the highest possible capacity factor with the minimum possible volatility. Uh, let me skip this just to show you the results. And here we can see Capacity factors for each individual country. Capacity factor is how much electricity on average you get from one resource, in this case is wind, for each unit of capacity that we have. So it ranges between zero and one or zero and one percent, a hundred percent. Hundred percent would mean that the installation is running at full capacity whole time. Uh, Fifty percent, for instance, would mean that the installation is running at half capacity for whole time. For wind, typical capacity factors in Europe range between 20 and 30%. In Turkey, each country by itself has too much volatility. These are, by the way, 30 years of hourly capacity factors simulated with, uh, uh, from this database, renewals. So each country in Turkey would have a lot of volatility, but if we select the countries with highest capacity factor and opposite generation patterns, we can get to some portfolio of uh, installation across countries that optimizes this one. So for instance, if we just take Spain and Portugal, which form the nivel electricity market, there is no benefit at all because they have two similar uh, generation patterns. But if we take the whole year, we can locate wind capacity strategically in the countries with highest capacity factor, but opposite generation patterns, such that we can get a quite high capacity factor at a much lower volatility. This is a standard deviation. Actually, is a, to put it in the same scale, it should be 15 and so to put it in the same scale of the capacity. So the basic idea here is all these are different portfolios. So each point along this line are different combinations of installed capacity. This is called the efficient frontier. So we could be anywhere along this frontier. And this point is the one that maximizes the capacity factor per unit of volatility. So that would be, let's say the optimal, uh, the technical optimal, but any point along this frontier would give us the minimum possible volatility for each level of capacity. And uh, to finalize, 
by doing this strategy of strategically locating capacity across countries, we can have a generation pattern that resembles a base load technology rather than a variable one. So here we can see the cumulative probability. That means once we have one portfolio, in this case, we have the optimal for, these are different markets in Europe. Even is just Spain and Portugal, North Pool is Nordic countries, and Epix spot is a Central Europe, uh, Western European country. So if we have just Spain and Portugal, let's say, then uh, we are about, uh, 15% of the time we are generating at capacity factors uh, below 10%. However, if we have the optimal portfolio in Europe, basically we don't have any occurrence of capacity factors below 10%. That means that we convert a variable technology into almost a base load in which there are no hours of the year or very a few hours of the year in which the capacity factor is lower than 10%. That's more or less the idea. This is still working progress. So we are still making calculations. And I finalize with the conclusions, which is that wind and solar are becoming the lowest cost electricity generation technologies, but they are variable. And that means that they come with integration costs, both to the system as a whole and to themselves that we call cannibalization. But there are many solutions for this. I just briefly mentioned spatial integration and deployment coordination. But uh, anything that increases the flexibility of the electricity system will help integrating renewables at lower cost, such as the first one, the most obvious is storage, both short term batteries, but even more important, seasonal storage. Demand response that is increasing uh, demand elasticity as much as possible. Uh, Xavier Lavandera from, you know, from ECOBUS has uh, some papers very good about um, how low uh, demand elasticity is. So we have to increase it by establishing dynamic pricing, uh, smart appliances that can change consumption across uh, prices and so on, and any type of clean and flexible backup capacity that can switch on and off very quickly. So that's it. That was a kind of overview about some of the main problems of integrated renewals and some of the solutions uh, that we can use to integrate. So yeah, thank you for joining again. And I'm happy to discuss any of this uh, a bit more. Thank you to you, uh, Javier. We have a question here in the chat. So um, the question is, how the cost reduction of renewable energies maybe or is already being affected by the supply chain tensions we are seeing since the mid-20s, 2020. What do you uh, think? Can you repeat how the correlation between renewables... How the cost reduction of renewable uh, energies maybe or is already affected by the supply chain tensions we are seeing since middle 2020. Mm -hmm. Actually, for some technologies and also for batteries, which depend a lot on commodity prices, we are seeing some kind of, uh, I guess, temporary increase in prices. But if actually, if you look at the uh, long-term uh, learning rates of solar, you can see that at some points there are tensions, uh, price tensions. But in the long term, costs are going down anyway. So we are seeing now a slight increase in prices in some markets and that's somehow a problem, but in the long term, the underlying cost of the technology is going down anyway. So in a few years, we will come back to the learning rate uh, trend. I showed only the evolution of costs in the last 10 years, but if you type on Google uh, PV learning rate, you will see a much longer trend. And you see that for each doubling in installed capacity, PV cost declined by about 23%. And I guess that uh, trend will continue. Okay. So, uh, if I can, well, just one more thing, <laughs> a bit more concerning about that, I would say, is the potential increase in interest rates because variable renewals are capital intensive. So, 
more than fossil fuels, so increasing uh, interest rates affect their cost much more than for fossil fuels. Okay, well, thank you, Javier. Uh, I guess if our uh, colleague Jorge has additional questions, he can post them. He's telling us that his micro doesn't work today. So we have what? I think we have two people who want to ask a question. The first who came in was Miguel, but he didn't raise his hand. We have Lucas with his hand up. Whoever wants to go ahead, please feel free, each of you or either, either of you. So, I don't know, Miguel, you want to go first since you switch on the camera first, or do you prefer uh, that? Um, sí, sí, sí. Venga. Um, venga, adelante. Bueno, hablar en, podría hablar en inglés, pero como mayoría que estamos aquí, que okay. que somos galegos, pues venga. Um, Hay, hay una, o, o trabajo me parece muy interesante y, es, y además está muy ligado a un trabajo que tengo con, con doctorando, así que bueno, se contactaré contigo y hablaremos. Uh -huh. eh, hay una cosa que dices en la presentación que un matizaría, porque eh, comentaches que, bueno, ahora mismo a, 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 los sistemas para almacenarse de energía no están disponibles. Entiendo que estás a pensar en almacenarse tipo batería, en línea. Eh, eu matizaría eso, es decir, sí que tenemos baterías y están funcionando muy bien y se pueden ampliar a corto plazo además con una gran capacidad que son eh, todos los sistemas de... Ay, eh, ¿Cómo decirlo? Entonces se me fue a cabeza el nombre. Bueno, tenemos eh, los encoros que son hiperanuales, que en realidad son baterías, unas baterías fantásticas y después tenemos todo el tema de... Ay, ¿Cómo se echaba? Pues no me sale la palabra. O de voltar a agua o se coros aguas arriba. ¿Cómo se echa? Um... Ah, al pan hydro. No, uh... Sí, sí, sí. No sé cómo se echa. Bombeo, bombeo. O bombeo, bombeo. efectivamente. <risas> y, y, y bueno, hay, hay un proyecto sí. tremendo en la zona portuguesa, al límite con co Galega, ahí en el río eh, Nolima, me parece que, o no, no sé si otro, que es una batería, pienso que de Iberdrola, es tremendo que están haciendo ahí y hay otras posibilidades. Es decir, no estamos a hablar de hacer nuevos encoros, evidentemente pero sí eh, reformular las instalaciones de algunos encoros para que tengan esa capacidad de, de bombeo. Más allá de que hay encoros que son, tienen carácter hiperanual, por lo tanto, eh, al fin y al cabo, no deben de ser una forma de batería. ¿no? Uh -huh. eh, nada, el coste de menos dios también existe un sistema de doble bombeo, tendremos. La respuesta corta es que estoy totalmente de acuerdo contigo. De hecho, o un dos papers que presenté, pero solo a primera parte del paper, digamos, eh, que es de López Pro de Shield 2021, el año pasado, es precisamente cómo el storage, cómo el almacenamiento va a ayudar a mitigar o cannibalization effect. Entonces, cuando mencioné que no se puede almacenar, es simplemente para indicar que esa condición es una de las que causan o cannibalization. Pero efectivamente, como mencionaste, cuanto más almacenamiento tengamos, más mitigaremos este efecto. Ya existe almacenamiento, como comentas, y va a haber mucho más. Eh, o bombeo que comentaste, esas baterías para corto plazo y, y termal también para, para seasonality, para eh, estacionalidad, eh, hidrógeno, que es una forma de almacenaje también, etc. Entonces, básicamente estoy de acuerdo en que sí que tenemos almacenamiento y habrá mucho más y contribuirá a solucionar o cannibalization, efectivamente. Pues estupendo, pues gracias Jorge, gracias Miguel por su intercambio de opiniones. Vamos luego con Lucas, que tenga mal levantada. Ah, vale, gracias. So, uh, should I, uh, perhaps we can uh, talk in English, just uh, to have everyone here uh, on board. Um, so, I have a couple, of, uh, basically a general question on two topics, perhaps a little bit far from the, the main focus of your talk, but I'm curious about how you see this. So, uh, relating how to plan ahead for um, basically in building up the, the installed power for wind power generation. I wonder if there are two factors that are, are going to be relevant or perhaps they are too far, far away, both in scale and in time. One are the effects of climate change, or climate change so global warming in changing the pattern, the wind uh, patterns in uh, across the world, and if that is going to affect the decision making in where to install the, the generators. And the second, I was wondering uh, if the total global friction, so to speak, that we introduced by, by creating these, by building these generators is going to have like uh, negative feedback effects over the production. And if that is going to be relevant either 
in overall uh, power production or in the market dynamics that uh, that is going to introduce. So if you can comment on this, that will be that will be great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So these are more natural sciences questions. So I can give you my informed guess, but the level of confidence in my answer is low. So take it with a grain of salt. Uh, regarding climate change, it will affect uh, some renewable energy technologies, such as uh, biomass, for instance, which depends on local ecosystems and solar. But I'm not aware of systematic changes in wind patterns. But I'm not sure. It could be the case. We would have to see natural science literature on that. I'm not aware of uh, any systematic changes in wind patterns due to climate change. But it could be, I don't know, actually it's a good question. I would like to know more about that. And regarding feedback effects uh, of building turbines, there are some studies that show that, for instance, when many turbines are built together, mainly for offshore installations, because it's where more of them are built just one next to each other, there is a reduction in overall capacity plan. But that's just something that uh, engineers deal with and they just calculate the optimum uh, distance uh, between uh, wind uh, turbines such that they don't have much feedback effects. So there is an effect. I think in onshore is not that relevant because anyway, they are more spaced out and less uh, crowded, let's say. But for offshore wind, I read something that that's an issue, but it's not very important anyway. It just reduces a bit the overall capacity factor. There is no concern, or at least uh, there's no concern about the global cumulated effect of all uh, wind power generation to, to affect the wind currents, right? As Where far as I'm aware, I don't think so. But as I said, I'm not very confident about this answer. So uh, I'm not sure. I don't think so, but I'm not sure. Uh, let's leave it alone. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Thank Thanks you. for commenting something that was not totally on point with your talk. Thanks. I no, no, it's a very good question. Actually, I will I will try to learn more about this. To next time I get asked this question, I can answer with more confidence. <laughs> Thank, Great. You. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you, Javier. Uh, I think we have another uh, comment here, Andre. Uh, Andre, I don't know if, you, if he entered just the chat. Not sure if he wants to post a question um, in Galego, in English, or okay, in in the meantime, I, I just have a very quick one so that uh, we can start uh, closing up. I thought it was very fascinating your talk and we learned a lot of new concepts and it was very interesting to reflect upon this cannibalization effect, right? But I wanted to ask you, um, how do you see energy markets in 20 years, for example, in Spain? Uh, I don't know if you are aware, but um, two days ago, Elon Musk, uh, the, the Tesla man, wrote a, a Twitter, a very famous tweet saying, wrote in Twitter uh, saying that uh, he was conceiving Spain as being like uh, the solar farm of Europe, basically. And he was encouraged, uh, encouraging the Spanish government just yes, to put up solar panels all over the place uh, in order for us to be like the new energy market of, of Europe and sell and export energy and be like the new goal, right? So um, if that was to happen, I'm sure there will, there will be a lot of disruptions in the market and, and um, who knows what will happen finally. But I wanted to ask you based on your knowledge and based on the fact that you are working a lot on renewables, how do you see, foresee uh, the energy mix in 20 years on in Spain, for instance? And uh, um, what do you think is gonna happen to market prices in general? Uh, thank you. So it's hard, first of all, it's hard to predict what will happen in the future. But if we want to go towards decarbonization, that I think we should, and the current events with Russia uh, encourage us to go even faster, uh, I think the energy mix should look like what the International Energy Agency suggests it should. In the last uh, report, actually, because in the previous ones, the International Energy Agency used to be quite conservative regarding uh, wind and solar. But in the net zero one, uh, because they set the objective net zero and then they just optimize uh, the system, then we have high shares of variable renewables. So I really think there will be many variable renewables, a lot of solar in Spain. Uh, there was a project called Desertic that tried to link uh, Northern Europe with, uh, with the Sahara, basically, with uh, the Mediterranean uh, Africa to generate there and import from them. That didn't succeed for political economic reasons. 
but uh, but the way to go, as I see it, is with higher levels of integration across countries. Spain will have to build more connections with France, both for gas and electricity. And uh, we will sell renewable electricity and we will buy much more as well when we don't have sun. Uh, we will buy uh, hydro and wind from the north and they will buy electricity from us. Uh, maybe because I'm working on spatial integration, I see that what, that's one of the main solutions to achieve higher levels of renewals at the lowest possible cost. And the last thing regarding market prices, uh, I really like this paper I mentioned before by Tom Brown and uh, I'm not sure if I pronounce well, Reichenberg or something like that. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing well, but they say that there is no problem as far as we internalize externalities. So as carbon prices go up, then prices in the wholesale market should be fine, should reflect uh, costs and benefits of flexibility. We are now seeing, excluding all the Russian uh, induced gas spikes, we are seeing also more fluctuations because we need more flexibility that we don't have. And many people say, oh, it's very bad that we have uh, so much volatility, but it's not bad. It's just the market saying that we need more uh, flexibility, either storage or demand management, et cetera. Another way of reducing volatility is through uh, EVs and uh, vehicle to grid mm -hmm. uh, connection. That means that uh, like, you know, cars are 90% uh, of the time parked. So if you just program your car, your EV, your electric car and say, I want my car to have 80% of its battery every day at 8 a.m. to go to work. But other than that, the car can be uh, charging and discharging. It will charge when it has uh, lowest prices, when we have a lot of renewals and it will discharge when we have these peaks in prices. So if all of us have this kind of system, then uh, market prices will just react and adjust more or less uh, the penetration of the different technologies, wind, solar, but also flexibility in the form of batteries, in the form of uh, pump, hydro, etc. Uh, thank you for these insights for the future. We have two questions more, <laughs> one in the chat and one Miguel. Miguel, if you allow me, I'm gonna read the one in the chat if it's okay for you. Yeah. Uh, this comes from Khalid al -Nimeidi. I hope I said it right. And he says, hi, Javier, any clue about adopted hybrid systems that consider uh, variable renewables and fossil fuel sources for power generation so we can avoid the complications of batteries and storage? So actually all power systems are a mix of different technologies nowadays. We have uh, fossil fuels and we have uh, uh, variable renewables. So that's what happened. what's happening nowadays. If you mean at one specific plant, it also happens with CSP, for instance. Uh, concentrated solar power plants sometimes start with uh, gas and uh, to start up the turbine and then uh, continue with solar energy. So that already happens both at local plants and the energy system as a whole is exactly that. It's a hybrid with so many different technologies and each one produces according to their costs and and technological characteristics. Base load plants have a high capital cost, fixed cost and low marginal, so they produce all time the same. And uh, gas turbines, for instance, they have high variable costs and low fixed costs, so they produce only on peak times. So that's basically what we are seeing nowadays with liberalized electricity system. Interesting reflection. He says many things. So Miguel, and then uh, Carlos Cervez also has a question. Miguel Rodríguez. No, no, Carlos, que vaya Carlos, una pregunta. Bueno. Carlos, entonces. Sí, uh, my question is uh, very elemental, very simple. Uh, everybody knows that the electricity prices are highest than ever. And uh, now, this is true? I don't think so. Uh, I mean, uh, 20 years ago, or 40 years ago or 10 years ago, the, the, the electricity bill, uh, the family's electricity bill in real prices, I mean, mm -hmm. not nominal prices, on real prices is, is much more expensive now than 20, 10, 20, 40, 50 years ago. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Do you know the, do you know the, the data? So, um... 
from the top of my mind, I can't tell you, but if you also consider purchasing power, because there was a lot of economic growth between the 90s and now, in terms of, 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 of salaries, then it's much instance. lower in purchasing power terms. Yeah. Yeah. Nominal yeah. terms, um, I'm not sure actually, I would have to look at it. Okay. No, but but uh, there is also, uh, if I may uh, just expand in a bit terms more. Of, uh, hours, uh, the, the hours, the, the number of hours of minutes of a normal worker, medium salary in Spain, uh, I think it is cheaper now than 10, 20, 40 years ago. Could be, yeah. I don't have the number from the top of my mind, but could be. Another thing is that many people confuse between wholesale prices and retail prices, mm -hmm. uh, which are connected, but not directly transferred from one to the other. So nowadays we are seeing a huge uh, spike in wholesale prices, but that will only translate to retail prices in a while to uh, to people who are in the liberalized market. Because in Spain, we have kind of hybrid retail market. You can go to the regulated or to the liberalized. Usually, the liberalized is more expensive on average, but you have uh, stable prices for a while. And the regulated is linked to the wholesale. So you have usually lower prices, but more volatile prices. Nowadays, because the wholesale is skyrocketing, now the retail market regulated part is more expensive, but usually is lower. Mm -hmm. I agree. Thank you for, uh, for these uh, points, uh, Javier. So our last question for, uh, for today, maybe is Miguel, go ahead. Okay, so uh, it is very funny, you know, the, the, the question about Elon Musk, because uh, behind that uh, comment, it is the idea that you can put uh, whatever you want about uh, solar and wind farms. Um, in a way, this is a question we, we are trying to address with my PhD student, because you have to realize that you have to electrify almost all the energy system, for instance, in Spain. And just for that, just for attend the future demand of electricity in Spain, perhaps you should think in using something like uh, 15, 20% of the land or roofs or whatever you want uh, in order to produce and attend that demand of electricity. So uh, thinking about Spain becoming uh, a main source of electricity for Europe from wind and solar is just uh, a mess. I can't understand that kind of uh, <laughs> comments. It's very funny to me something very crazy uh, well, as um, no sense i'm not saying i'm supporting it i just was bringing uh, bringing it up for yeah me. yeah i know no it is very important <laughs> to to realize i know you, you know opportunity that cost very, the opportunity. yes uh, yeah, very important to realize the problem the problem of trying to electrify all the uh, energy system yeah. so that there, there are some constraints physical constraints right? in, in terms of you cannot uh, put uh, solar farms uh, in all the land of the Spain, that is not possible. I agree, but somehow I disagree in the sense that, of course, the Elon Musk statement is a kind of exaggeration because he likes to do this kind of uh, hyperbole. Yeah, yeah. But it has some truth in the sense that I think that different regions will specialize in different resources. And the south of Europe will specialize in sun, in solar. Uh, the north will specialize in uh, wind. Uh, Norway will specialize in being the battery of Europe. It's had, it's been said because they have a lot of hydro and pump hydro, and uh, so there will be an integration. And when there is integration, there is also a specialization. So, so I think there is some truth there. Of course, not as exaggerated, but uh, don't you think that that there may be some problems with social acceptability of this kind of integration because it's for instance for right now in norway for instance they are they are um, at a red, retail prices they are paying quite a lot of high prices for electricity uh, despite that most of the electricity in norway is from hydro but because they have this same integration with the rest of europe at least in the nordic countries they have to pay quite a lot for the electricity despite despite of that that uh, capacity that is almost everything on based on hydro so uh, right i see it's some, two, some problems for that 
Right, I see two ways of social acceptability that may hamper uh, diffusion of both integration and uh, renewals. One is uh, the one you mentioned. So regions that are specialized in production would have much lower prices if they weren't connected. If you have a lot of solar, you would have much lower prices if you are not connected than if you sell your solar abroad. The same with, uh, it's exactly what's happening now with Norway. They have uh, with batteries, let's say, in the form of uh, pump hydro. If they use that to balance the electricity system of Europe, producers gain from that, but consumers in Norway lose from that because they face higher prices. So it's a matter of redistribution of uh, the surplus, producer surplus or consumer surplus. But overall, it pays off to, to integrate, of course, because the overall surplus will be higher if we are all together. And the second uh, acceptance issue, I think, is with the physical infrastructure, both for wind and solar and for lands. We are seeing already a lot of uh, opposition against uh, renewable energy, uh, which are actually quite uh, uh, sustainable anyway, if you compare it with the alternative, which is fossil fuels. Mm. So that may be another barrier. Well, this topic is super interesting and we could keep asking you, uh, Javier, a lot of questions, but uh, but we are well over the hour and we thank you very, very much for, for your presentation, which was very stimulating and very interesting.